Hey church, welcome to our online service. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I realize it's summer, it's Sunday. There is literally a million things you could be doing, but you're here and uh, we love that. We love that we are still a church and uh, whether you're gathering with us weekly on Sundays or not, um, we're all in this together. And uh, let's face it, it's a weird season that we're in. Uh, You might notice I'm not Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott has been preaching hard since really the beginning of COVID. And uh, in in that, like that's that's a long time to just back to back to back be delivering sermons. And so uh, he's got this week off from preaching and that means that I get to preach. But we are in a series and it's called Cherry Picked. And uh, if, if you're, you know, if the name is confusing to you, I just want to explain it a little bit. You know, when somebody cherry picks something, it means you kind of pick it and pull it out of its context. And so we are looking at verses in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, all throughout that have been cherry picked by Christians. In other words, they've been pulled out of context and made to mean something that they weren't intended to mean. And so we're just looking at them with fresh eyes and uh, trying to discover what is the true meaning of these verses? What do they really mean and how do we apply it to our lives? So with that being said, I just want to do one more thing really quick is that uh, I want to give a quick shout out to our tech team, our media team. You know, during COVID, we have had uh, an increased demand for creating videos and communication that can't happen on a Sunday morning because let's face it, we're not all together on a Sunday morning. And that has put a huge, huge uh, demand on our tech team and and the need to create videos. And that's meant that time and resources have gone that direction. And so uh, I just want to shout out to one, I want to shout out to Chad. I want to say like, Chad, our creative director has just done an awesome job. And also Dan, um, and everyone that's pitched in on our staff that's just done a, a crazy good job. If you guys see them, you see them on posting on social media, however, um, just give them a high five and thank them for all the extra work that they've put in during this season. So we are going to jump into it. And um, like I said, we're in this series, Cherry Picked. And uh, that series is um, is about how certain verses get pulled out of context. And so today we're going to look at a passage that often gets cherry picked. And I think this passage may be responsible for creating more Christian Pharisees than literally any other passage in the entire New Testament. And the reason is because when we cherry pick this passage, it seems to give us as Christians like license uh, to go about um, exerting control over other Christians and imposing rules on them uh, and regulations that they have to follow. So generally, um, this is done, w- I think, with good motives. I think people don't cherry pick this verse on purpose. They're not trying to do something uh, bad. They're not trying to, to, to get off on the wrong track, but eventually it will lead that direction if we don't correct it. And so before we get started, I want to frame sort of this entire conversation um, by the main point that Paul is trying to make in in the passage that we're going to look at. And see, Paul, in this passage, he was encouraging the Roman church to live with a love for each other that will produce freedom and unity. Okay, love that produces freedom and unity. Um, And when this passage gets cherry-picked, unfortunately, it doesn't produce uh, love and unity and freedom. Instead, it produces religion and division. It produces control that causes religion and division. And so you can see that it's really important that we don't cherry pick this passage, that we understand what it really means um, and that it doesn't get misused because the result, religion and division, is the exact opposite of why Paul wrote it. So my question to get started is this, which would you rather have? Would you rather have unity and freedom or would you rather have religion and division? And If you said freedom and unity, uh, like I hope you would, like I would, um, then get ready because no matter who you are, if you really want unity and freedom in church, then you're going to be challenged to lay down your right to be right. See, rightness does not guarantee righteousness. And even if you are right, you may still have a long way to go to find righteousness. So, We're going to dive in. Remember the goal, though. We're looking at love that produces freedom and unity. 
Um, so our cherry, per- our cherry picked passage uh, comes from a verse at the end of Romans chapter 14. And this is, uh, this is how it goes, Romans 14, 21. And it says this, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another to stumble. So if you're like a, a steak lover or a wine lover, you're probably immediately like, whoa, whoa, I'm out. Okay, and let me read it one more time because this is our conversation today. It, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. So what's the cherry-picked meaning of this verse? The cherry-picked understanding is this. See, when Christians cherry-pick it, um, they take an approach of sort of compiling a list of anything that might cause a believer to stumble, um, and then that list becomes a list of rules that we have to impose on all Christians, right? So if we don't want to cause anyone to stumble, what would cause people to stumble? And then make a list out of that, and we sort of impose it on everyone. Um, you can imagine how this would work in a church, right? So if, if we were to sort of pull the audience and find out what everybody struggles with, like what, what, what area would cause any one of us to stumble, then we would make a list of that. And then we would, we would try to make everyone follow that list of rules. So let's say, you know, sister Mildred stu- st- struggles with alcohol. Um, well, then nobody's allowed to drink, right? Because that might cause sister Mildred to stumble. Or let's say brother Steve struggles with gambling. So Nobody's allowed to play cards or buy lottery tickets because we don't want Steve to, to stumble. Or maybe Brother Philip, you know, struggles with gluttony, okay? He just, he eats too much. I mean, have you seen him? Uh, okay, so nobody is allowed then to eat and especially not go to restaurants because that might cause Brother Phil to, uh, to, to stumble. Um, or maybe Sister Janice, she has a shopping addiction. And so nobody's allowed to go to the mall because if Sister Janice were to see you in the mall, um, that would cause her to stumble. And I'm looking at you, H&M shoppers. Okay, no more. All right. So obviously, like, these are funny examples. It's, it's comedy. It's kind of comedic to think about. Um, but they're not that far away from how the church has actually often handled this passage. Um, it's really not that far at all. So growing up, I was taught in church uh, that you were not to drink alcohol. Okay. Now, a lot of these things that we're going to talk about today, a lot of these issues that are sort of disputable issues is what we call them, like things that the Bible really doesn't deal with completely. Um, a, a lot of these issues are actually things that um, maybe we don't deal with a lot here at, at this church. In fact, some of the examples that Paul gives are like, we don't deal with those now in America at all. But I want you to see that in looking at them, it frames how we should react in all issues that are disputable, all issues that are like that. So I was taught, you know, you shouldn't drink alcohol. Now you might agree with that or you might disagree with that, but here's how it becomes imposed as a rule, right? So if you shouldn't do that and you don't want to cause, uh, you know, a brother or a fellow believer to stumble, then then what should you do, right? Well, of course you don't drink alcohol, but then there's other things that you wouldn't want to do too, because if they were to say, see you in, at a bar, then they might think that you were drinking alcohol, so you don't go to a bar. And then, you know, what if you parked in front of the bar and they were to drive by and see your car in front of the bar? Uh, they might think that you were in there and they might think that you were drinking alcohol. That might cause them to stumble. So we don't park in front of the bar. We don't go into the bar. Um, and you might laugh at that. You might think, like, this is funny. This is hilarious. Who, who would live like this? But this is actually how it was interpreted to me is that, you know, if you really care about your brother, you don't even park in front of the bar. Um, You don't even linger in front of the beer aisle in the grocery store, right? Because somebody might see you and that would cause them to stumble and we don't want to cause them to stumble. We want to avoid the appearance of evil. And so really the only, the only safe way to, to not accidentally or incidentally cause somebody to stumble is to avoid all of it. So when I got my license as a teenager, I avoided parking in front of the bar, right? Because I didn't want to cause anyone to stumble. Um, but is that really what Paul meant? Is that actually what he was getting at? Is that, is that the, the thrust of this verse and this passage that we're going to look at? Um, I don't think that's what it was really about. So not only, you know, alcoholism might be an issue that, that, you struggle with or don't struggle with. Um, but what about other disputable issues, right? So what about, say, cussing or dancing or secular music or tattoos? What about fashion or media and movies or sports or wealth or tobacco? Um, 
if we were to say apply the same fervor to these disputable issues as we applied in my story from childhood, you can see how quickly there would be this huge list of things that we would have to follow. And we would have to be very careful about all kinds of, of you know, subtle things that might just point to something that would cause someone to stumble. Um, but was that really what Paul was arguing for? Is that really his goal in this passage to sort of saddle all believers with a, a new law and a nuanced behavior, um, expectations that have to be followed to a T? Uh, some would argue, yes. Yeah, th that's exactly what we should do. Um, listen to this excerpt that I found from a church. And I think this is a little bit old, so I don't, don't exactly know which church it was. Um, but this was in their description of what was expected of people who attended their church. Okay, this is what it says. It says, members shall not indulge in the world's methods of pleasure seeking, amusements and entertainment, patronizing or taking parts in fairs. That one would crush my wife. Okay, she's devastated that Ravalli County canceled their fair. But put that aside. Uh, also, parades, circuses, moving picture shows. I think they mean movies. <laughs> Theaters, drama, public bathing resorts, organized contesting ball teams, which is sports, I think. Um, dancing, card parties, races, various forms of gambling, scavenger hunts, mystery suppers, hay rides, and such like. And then it goes on, it says this, Inasmuch as our automobiles, as well as all our possessions, are gifts from God, they should be in keeping with biblical modesty and separation, and the use of them should always glorify God. The more expensive cars, cars with contrasting colors, sports cars, as well as sports features on regular cars, and all striped tires shall be avoided. The appearance and use of all our vehicles shall be consistent with these principles and regulations. Because the effectiveness of the radio to propagate evil and increased end time deception, thereby destroying true spirituality in the home church, its use is not permitted. So no radios in your cars that have to be normal cars. Um, but the devil or the evils of tele or because of the evils of television, those who are responsible for the sale and the use of the same forfeit their membership. Video cassette recorder, that's a VCR, which is kind of like how people watched movies before how they watch movies now, um, shall not be used. Uh, we likewise sense the dangers of the news media, uh, which that one I may agree with, um, as daily papers, uh, such as daily papers, magazines in the home. Um, so basically, you know, got to watch out for those hay rides and cars with striped tires because uh, they can take you to some pretty dark places, I guess. Um, but can you see how, how all of these things that are disputable issues can quickly turn into this long list of rules that we are expected to follow in order to measure up? And some of you, when you hear that, you might be triggered because maybe you have like a religious background or something where you were a part of like a, an extreme uh, religious organization or an organization that, that imposed rules like this. And maybe it triggers you because you're, you're sort of like, you know, like I, I, I remember what that was like. But some of you might also be like, actually, I agree with a lot of those things. Um, we should follow those. And, and you can see how, uh, you know, you might even be ready to argue or to go to bat for your side because you're like, no, those things aren't of God. And you're like, yeah, but, but it honors God. And, and that's okay, right? That's why Paul wrote what he wrote is because we have disagreements on some of these things and the Bible doesn't explicitly address hay rides. Um, I, I'm sorry, it doesn't. And so because we have these strong beliefs, we don't always do a great job dwelling in unity together um, and because instead, right, remember our goal, love that produces freedom and unity. Instead, we end up imposing control that produces religion um, and causes division. So stick with me. We're going to get into this entire passage and, and we'll start at the beginning of Romans chapter 14. But first, I just want to tell you a quick story. So when I when I was first starting out in youth ministry, um, the first pastor that I worked for was an older pastor. He had kind of come out of retirement. He was an incredible man uh, in, his, in his late 70s, I believe. And uh, he had pastored in Oregon during the time in the 60s and 70s when the Jesus movement happened. And if you're familiar with the Jesus movement, it was this time when all these hippies were sort of coming to Jesus. And uh, so a lot of these 
these people on the West Coast that you know, had been living the hippie lifestyle, they started turning to Jesus and, and many of them came to his church. And he said to me one time, because he was kind of reminiscing like, oh man, it was, such, it was such a cool time seeing these people be saved and seeing them come to Jesus. And then he said, and you know what? When they came to church, we didn't even have to tell them to cut their hair. They were just doing it on their own. And I remember when he said that, I, I was like, I was like, unbelievable. Like you think the measure of, of spirituality is how long your hair is? You know what? It, it really struck me sideways. And in some ways it was almost funny because it sounded sort of archaic, but in other ways it was also kind of sad that like, this is how you measured spirituality. And, and I understand what he was thinking, you know, that like their hair was sort of a symbol of their rebellion. And so to cut it was sort of, you know, turning from their rebellion, but, um, but it really struck me. And, and, and I sort of set out from that point to be like, I am, I think I'm gonna grow my hair out. And it was a little bit of like, that part of me is being like, I'll show you that you can be a man of God and have long hair, right? Like I'm going to demonstrate this in action. Um, but I want to follow, I'm going to, I'm going to finish that story at the end. So let's put a pin in it. But I started growing my hair out and I'm telling you, I got to some luscious locks. I mean, they were like down past my shoulders and I looked good. I thought about, thought about showing a picture, but I don't want to cause, um, any of the women to swoon, or anything like that. So let's, let's get into Romans chapter 14 and, uh, Let's see what Paul had to say. So this is what Paul says. He says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another has a sensitive conscience and will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. For God has accepted them who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. I love that last part. Like it's not even up to us whether we are approved. It's, it's the fact that he, we will receive his approval because he's able to make us worthy of it. So Paul describes here four types of believers. And I, I want to go through those really quick because I want us to see uh, ourselves in this group. So the first kind is the kind that recognizes their weakness, right? He says, he says there are some who uh, are weak and they, uh, they, you know, they can't eat certain kinds of food. Um, their faith won't allow it. Then he also says uh, the second kind, those who are weak, but instead of sort of admitting that they're weak, they judge those who are free in the area that they're weak. So they're like, well, I can't eat, and cer eat certain kinds of food. And if you do, I'm gonna condemn you. I'm gonna judge you. Then there's the third kind. And those who are strong, right? The, those who are um, aware that others aren't able to eat this kind of food, but they feel perfectly free to eat that kind of food. Then there's those who are free are strong, but their freedom has filled them with pride, right? they can't understand why anyone would think it's wrong to eat this kind of food, right? They think it's just ridiculous that everyone makes a big deal out of it or, or people can't see why it's okay. So four kinds of people, those that, those that recognize their weakness, those that are weak, but they condemn those who aren't. There's those who are strong and care for those who are weak, but, and then there's those who are strong and look down on those who are weak. These are the people that Paul describes. And my question is, is, is which one am I? Which one are you? When you look at that list, when you hear that, which one are you? I would tell you that I am all four. Absolutely, I recognize that some areas in my life, I'm weak where others are strong. Sometimes in those areas where I'm weak and others are strong, I actually pass judgment or condemn those who have freedom in the area that I don't. I look at them and I'm like, I don't think they should do that because I think it's wrong for me and I, I'm, and I judge them for what they do. Also, sometimes I'm strong in areas where others are weak and I'm able to show them compassion. But sometimes my freedom makes me sort of proud and causes me to look down on others who don't have a similar freedom. I think, I don't understand. Why do they struggle with that? It's not a big deal. Get over it. So, 
Paul uses um, this word and it's translated weak. And I think it's a little bit of, a, it's a dangerous word if we, if we think about it because none of us want to be weak, right? I know you're looking at me and I'm just so much wider than Pastor Scott. I've, you know, my biceps are so much bigger than his. Um, and it, it would probably bother him to, to know, you know, that in this relationship between him and I, like he's weaker than I am. But here's the thing. Okay, that's a joke, you guys. That's a joke. Obviously, Pastor Scott is like super ripped and I'm not. But, but nobody wants to be weak. You don't want to be called weak. I don't want to be called. We all want to be strong, right? So in, in characterizing these two sides, um, Paul wasn't trying to just cut the church down the middle and say, these are the weak ones, these are the strong ones. He, he's pointing out that all of us struggle sometimes and all of us are strong sometimes. And so how do we act when we struggle? How do we act when we're strong? When we struggle, do we act like everyone who doesn't struggle is wrong, that they're sinners, that they're bad, because the thing that we struggle with, they don't struggle with. And when we're strong, do we act like it's our own strength, that we're like, we're so tough, and, and why does everybody not get it like we get it? Are we condescending toward people? That's what he's, he's saying. Like, obviously, um, it's kind of laden with this, with this challenge, because if we think of ourselves as strong, then we are given over to pride, and we're like, Obviously, I'm strong and they're weak, um, which that pride in itself is, a, is weakness. That pride in itself is the very thing Paul is saying we ought not to do. But all of us are weak. All of us struggle. And sometimes we're not weak. Sometimes we're strong. How do we, how do we react when we are weak? How do we react when we are strong? See, Christians have this really nasty habit of sort of focusing on things that they don't struggle with. Like it's easier to point out somebody else's sin than to deal with my own. And often that's how we, how we get it. But Paul is advocating for something that's actually pretty radical when you think about it. See, if someone has a weak conscience about something, he's saying they should leave the one who doesn't, the one who doesn't struggle with that issue, they should leave them alone. They should leave them to be free and to not struggle with it. You shouldn't try to drag them into your struggle. On the other hand, he's also speaking to the believer who doesn't struggle, who's free in an area. Um, and he, he says that person shouldn't look down on the person who's not. That sh- person shouldn't treat the person who struggles as less than. He shouldn't, he shouldn't treat them poorly because they struggle. And he, he shouldn't flaunt his freedom in front of them so that it causes them to sin. So I thought about this and I thought communion is a great example of how this works, right? Because if you were here pre-COVID, you know that we have communion tables set up and there's like cracker and then on one side there's wine and one side there's juice okay so so I say that I bring this up because Paul talks about wine as one of these disputable issues and it's definitely an issue that if we were to poll everybody we'd find out some people you know are over here and some people are over here that we you know we have different opinions about how we should handle alcohol as Christians as believers so here we are at Zootown Church we've got wine we've got juice it's set out and here's how the first believer would, would handle it. Because I think this really, looking at how each of these believers would handle that situation demonstrates to us which one, uh, you know, how we ought to handle it. So let's take the believer who is weak in their faith toward alcohol. Maybe they've struggled with it. Maybe they've had family members struggle with it. They just, for them, alcohol is a weakness. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to mess with that. So, so they would come to the communion table and being weak in faith toward alcohol, they would look and they would be thankful that there is an option that, that, that the juice is there for them and they're, they're not forced to violate their conscience. Okay, they would feel cared for and honored. Okay, hey, somebody thought of me. It's not just wine. There's juice here that I can, that I can take. But what about the second believer, the one who's weak toward alcohol but judgmental of those who are not? Well, this person would probably walk up and, and see the juice and see the alcohol and they, and they would be incensed that the alcohol is even there. How dare they put that out? How dare they call this a church with alcohol at communion? And what they would do is they would probably leave immediately and they would probably send a letter or leave like an online review with this scathing comment about the sin that happens inside this building. Um, what about the third one, right? The believer who's free in the area of alcohol would, would probably walk up and they would see the juice and wine. They'd probably take whichever one they preferred in that moment on that day. Um, and they would be thankful, right? They would be thankful because... Um, there's an option for the brother or sister who's weak in alcohol and they care for that person and they want to be able to worship together with that person and to continue to, to join together 
and, and honor Jesus together. And so they'd be thankful. Um, but what about the fourth believer, the believer who tends to be free uh, in the area of alcohol, but, but struggles with condescension toward those who aren't? They would probably walk up and finding that the wine was all gone and all that was left is juice, they would probably grudgingly take the cup of juice. But in the back of their minds be thinking, you know what, this is ridiculous. Why do we even have juice anyway? I mean, don't people know that Jesus drank wine? And if Jesus drank wine, I mean, if it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Can you see the heart behind each person in this particular issue? Can you see how it's revealed in the way that we interact and the way that we react? The historical context of what Paul is is talking about is actually... uh, you know, he talks about meat. Well, he's not saying all meat. He's actually referring to meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And if you're really interested in this, you can look up 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There's a parallel passage, and he talks very specifically about the meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Also in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And, and really, it's, it's a unity issue because when the church in Jerusalem gave commands to the, to the Gentile believers, one of the commands was that they were not, to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, this wasn't an issue because the meat itself was bad or, or unholy or you know, unrighteous. It, it wasn't anything like that. In fact, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man um, that defiles him, it's what comes out. And Paul echoes that when, when he says in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, what am I trying to say? Am, am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. And then he goes on in Romans 4, 14, 14, he says, I know that I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in itself is wrong to eat. So he's pointing out, he's like, he's like it's not the fact that it's the food, it's the fact that it disrupts the unity, right? Because when the, the Jerusalem council issued this command to the Gentile believers, the reason they did it is, is found in Acts chapter 15, verse 21. And they said this, for these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. See, the whole point was like, this has been so drilled into the Jewish mind that if Gentile you know, believers and Jewish believers were to fellowship together, there's no way that the Jewish believers could handle them eating food that's been sacrificed to idols. There's no way that they, they would lose their minds because they're like, they're seeing what's going on and it's just been ingrained in them. And so to preserve unity, right? Because all across the Roman empire, every church was a mixture of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And so to preserve the unity, he, they just said, you know what, just don't do it. Just don't do it, okay? Because it would be too hard for the Jewish believers to stomach. Ooh, that was a good pun, right? Too hard to stomach. It wasn't the food itself that was wrong to eat. So let's continue in Romans chapter 14. Verse five says this, in the same way, some think that one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day, do it to honor him. And those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be the Lord of both the living and the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer, right? He's talking to both of them here. He says to the weak, why are you condemning those who are strong? You see, we often make this only about those who are strong in an issue, catering to those who are weak in an issue. But Paul is calling out both sides. Paul is like, like look, if you're weak, you're con- why are you condemning? And if you're strong, why are you looking down? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Do you see the theme here? It's God's to judge. It's not ours to judge. So Paul mentions these three things here, right? So he talks about um, eating idle meat. He talks about drinking wine. And he talks about, uh, you know, which day you're observing for the Lord. But I hope that you're kind of seeing he, he's not actually talking about the issue being to eat or not to eat. 
And the issue is not to drink wine or not to drink wine. And the issue is not, um, you know, do we worship on Saturday? Do we worship on Sunday? Do we worship on Monday? That's not the issue. The issue is what is our heart like toward those who are convicted differently than we are? See, the weaker believer is tempted uh, to condemn the stronger believer. And the stronger believer is tempted to be condescending toward the weaker believer. Uh, but, but Paul is pointing out that both of those sides are wrong. Like if, if you are a weaker believer and you're condemning towards somebody who's free in an area that you're not, you're wrong. If, if you are uh, a stronger believer and you're condemning somebody because, uh, you know, or, or looking down on somebody because they're, they're not uh, as strong in an area as you are, then you're wrong. So Paul says, stop judging each other. God is the, the one who will judge. In verse 13, he goes on to say this, let's stop condemning each other. Be, decide instead to live in such a way that you, will ca- that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. See, we, we tend to read this and we think like this always just, it flows one way, right? The stronger believer is able to cause the weaker believer to stumble. But Paul actually says here, stop condemning each other and decide not to live in such a way that causes another believer to stumble. In other words, it flows both ways. Like it's not just that the stronger believer can cause the weaker believer to stumble, but the weaker believer, if they are condemning toward the stronger believer, can actually cause the stronger believer to stumble, You see, when we take the cherry-picked version of this, uh, it it often leads to Christians who actually despise liberty and they start to revile other Christians who live in freedom. Paul very clearly points out here that it goes both ways. Both the strong and the weak can cause each other to stumble. And Paul says, he says, stop it. And I want to say this too, because... It's not, it's not that, that Paul is commanding believers to start tiptoeing around legalistic Christians who are trying to trap them and control them, right? He, he's not saying that, that we ought to just take everyone's issues and then we all just tiptoe around those legalistic Christians. Actually, a mature Christian can hold a conviction, let's say about alcohol, right? Uh, a mature Christian can say, you know what, I choose not to drink because it's, a, it's an issue for me. Maybe I've struggled with it. Maybe my family struggled with it, but I'm not going to do it. It's my conviction. And at the same time, leave other Christians free to drink. They extend freedom to others and leave it for God to judge. But a weaker brother, a true weaker brother is not a legalistic Christian that's trying to control everybody. A true weaker brother is somebody who actually stumbles or actually struggles with something. It's not a believer who should be mature enough to to extend grace to others where they themselves are weak, but instead they spend their energy and their time trying to impose their beliefs on others and trying to control them in these disputable matters. So I want to say something to the cherry pickers, right? So, so if you see yourself in that, and like I said before, I see myself in that sometimes. There are times when, when I do that, when I don't have freedom in an area and I actually judge people who do. But if you see that in yourself, I want to challenge you. If you would spend less time focused on trying to clamp down on people who have freedom in areas that you don't, and more time just looking in your own heart and asking God to point out the, the areas where religion has taken hold, where, where rule following has, has actually taken hold in your heart and taken root, I think you would be a lot happier and you would probably have more friends. And I say that to myself too, because I understand there's definitely times in my life where I have broken relationships and I have hurt people because I have falsely judged them because they had freedom in an area that I did not. So Paul goes on to say this in verse 14. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in itself is wrong to eat. But some believer, some believe, if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't criticize 
uh, don't let your e- eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, he, he's pointing out what Jesus said, right? Is that it's not even what goes into your body from the outside that defiles it, but it's what comes from the inside. Jesus said this, and, and what he's saying is, is that the kingdom of God isn't about what you eat. It's not about what you drink, but it's about what's coming from inside. It's about the work that God is doing inside of you. Verse 18 says, if you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work that, of God over what you eat. We're going to come back to that verse. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between God and yourself. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty about something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not, sin- not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. Remember, Paul, Paul is not talking about letting our freedom be controlled by religious people. Paul absolutely never catered to that. Um, and Jesus never did either. In fact, Jesus, when, when the religious people would try to box him in, when they would try to control Jesus, Jesus always, always stood up against it. And Paul does too. You actually see that Paul was willing to even confront Peter um, when Peter was being religious, when Peter was, was holding to rules that, um, that were not good. And so, um, so that's not what he's doing here. He's not saying that as a, as a church and as believers that we need to cater to religious people and tiptoe around them and be afraid of their opinions. Um, instead, he's pointing out that, that it's about caring for one another. And that's why when he, he brings us in, he, he says it's, not all, it's also not about just protecting our own freedom, right? It's not about us, you know, protecting our freedom and our ability to do things at all costs, especially at the expense of somebody who has a genuine struggle in an area of disputable issues. So Paul says this, and I, and I said we'd come back to it because I think it's so powerful, it's so convicting. Paul says, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. It's such a convicting statement because Christians and churches are constantly fragmenting over disagreements uh, and often about just minor disputable things. And so we see, you know, churches fragmenting off and, and new churches formed and new denominations formed and all because churches are tearing apart the work of God because of disputable issues. Paul says, just don't make it that big of a deal. So I realize that none of us probably struggle with eating idol meat, right? Like, and I say idol, I mean like, like an idol, like meat that's been sacrificed to a false idol. Um, it's just not an issue that we struggle with in America. We're not, you know, going out and seeing this happening. And, and it's, it's more of a first century thing that, that the Christians were dealing with in Paul's day. But for us, uh, there's other disputable issues that have plagued the church for decades, for centuries, and even today. And so, you know, I touched on a few of them at the beginning and, and they were kind of funny and interesting, but I wanna like, I wanna go through a list here that I wrote down of things that we sort of struggle with that are disputable issues. So these are the issues of hot dispute, okay? Um, number one, how about uh, theater, movies, uh, media, what you watch, what you consume uh, visually? Um, you know, what is, what is acceptable for a Christian to watch? What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? There's probably some differing opinions if we were to ask all of you, right? Um, how about cosmetics, jewelry, or makeup? You know, what's, what's an appropriate way for a Christian to dress, 
to present themselves. Um, you know, what kind of jewelry is acceptable? What kind of clothing is acceptable? How about alcohol, right? We've, we've kind of hit on that a lot. Um, and not because we, uh, you know, not because I think it's a huge issue, but I do think that the church in general was, is probably divided on this, okay? Um, how much alcohol should a Christian drink? Should they drink any at all? Uh, tobacco, card playing and gambling, dancing, uh, fashion, how about this one? Bible translations. Uh-oh, I said it. Bible translations. Okay, what, what's, an, what's an acceptable translation to read and what's not? And what's even a translation and what's a paraphrase? How about uh, sports? You know, how much involvement uh, or obsession should a Christian have when it comes to, you know, their favorite football team or whatever? I mean, it's kind of like Nacho Libre said, Libre said, uh, you know, like the, those wrestlers are false idols. You know, people worship them. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about music? You know, what kind of music should a Christian listen to or what's acceptable? What's not? Um, material wealth. How much money should a Christian have and what should they do with it? Uh, cussing. Is it okay for a Christian to say a cuss word or not? Okay. Uh, how about tattoos? Uh, is it acceptable for a Christian to have a tattoo or not to have a tattoo? Should they get them uh, or should they not get them? What about what about this one? Okay. And this one might challenge some of you. What about some of the passages in the Bible, some of the verses that really aren't explicit, you know? And so different Christians draw different conclusions from the same passages in the Bible or the same, uh, you know, books or, or chapters in the Bible. And, and what are we to make of that? Right? Like, um, which one should we follow? Or is it a disputable issue? Is it something that we, um, can take opposite views on and still love Jesus? So if we were to take all of these issues, and I'm sure there's many more, you can probably think of some, um, and we were to sort of put them on a spectrum, right? Like uh, here, here's the Christian spectrum. And all the way on this side, we have, you know, Christians should never do this thing. Um, it, it's never acceptable for them. And then all the way on this side, it's, it's totally acceptable for a Christian to do this and they should do this, you know, whenever they want. Where would you put these issues? You know, if, if we were to poll everybody and say, Show us where you place alcohol on this line. Should never do it. Do it whenever you want. Show us where you would put getting tattoos on this. You know, if we were to do that, we would probably find that we hold different opinions throughout our body. We hold different opinions. Uh, maybe even in your own family, you hold different opinions. You know, for, for your wife, it might be this. And for you, it might be this. And, and there's different opinions on it. And so my, uh, this is exactly what Paul is getting at, right? He says, don't tear down the work of God over any of this. You disagree. You disagree. Y you're over here. They're over here. I'm over here. You're over here. But don't let it tear down what God is doing. Don't let it tear down what God is building. You see, one of the dangers in church that often happens is that church can develop into a culture of conformity. And here's what I mean by that, okay? You have church A over here, and at church A, we'll just use drinking alcohol again because it seems to be an easy whipping boy for us. Um, but church A over here, at, at our church, no one drinks alcohol. And if you come to our church, you're gonna have to abide by that rule. You're gonna conform, right? It's not acceptable. And then you have church B over here where it says, well, at our church, everybody drinks alcohol. And Actually, if you come to our church and you don't drink, you're not going to be able to really belong. You're not going to feel like you're really a part of it um, until you drink. Okay, so either side, the, the one we would call weak, the one we would call strong, or either side has developed a culture of conformity where in order to fit in, you have to be just like us. And Paul is not saying that at all. Paul is actually, he's advocating for diversity. He's, he's saying uh, a, a true church has unity, that they're unified in the main things, but they also maintain diversity. In other words, you don't have to conform one way or the other in order to fit in. He, he's literally saying you can disagree about something that's a disputable issue, but the important thing is not, is not who is right, but that you maintain unity. He, he's challenging us. Don't just try to bend others to our own will, whatever that might be. So I, I came across this quote from a Lutheran theologian from the 1600s. His name was Rupertus Meldinius. All right, great name. Um, but this is, what, this is what he said, and it's simple. It's super simple, but I love it because I feel like it just brings all of it into focus. He says this, in essentials, unity. 
in non-essentials, liberty or freedom, in all things, charity or love. So, so I'll say it again, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Isn't that beautiful? No matter how we sort of slice this, the burden generally falls or, or the bulk of the burden generally falls on what we would call the strong or the mature believer. The same way that the burden for unity in my family falls on me uh, as the parent or the adult, the mature one, right? If I was to sort of act like a child uh, and fight and kick and scream in order to get my way, then am I really proving that I am the mature one or am I actually proving the opposite, that I'm not the mature one, but instead I use my strength and my maturity to care for my children. I care for their weakness. I help them over things that are too difficult for them. I pick them up when they fall down. And ultimately my goal is to raise my kids to be strong and mature. So watch how Paul sums it up in Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, one and two says this, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. Even Christ, Jesus didn't live to please himself. But I love that he says we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. In other words, we all have a part to play. And if you are a strong believer, if you have freedom in an area that your brother doesn't have freedom in, you're, you're not just called to, to leave him there and say, well, it's too bad for him, you know. No, we're called to actually help each other. We're actually called to help build each other up. And the goal would be that, that, that he gains strength in that area, and then he can in turn help someone else who's weak. So church, let's move away from control that leads to religion and division. And let's focus on love that leads to freedom and unity. So I told you I would finish my hair story, all right? And, uh, and, and like I said, you know, I had this pastor and he was, um, you know, he told me the story and I kind of like wanted to like, you know, I wanted to prove it, that wrong, right? Like God doesn't care what your hair length is. He, he's actually, you know, you can be a man of God and have long hair. Um, you can be a woman of God and have short hair. And so, uh, so it kind of put this thing in me where I was like, I was gonna grow my hair out and I was gonna show that like you could have long hair and be a man of God. And you know, this pastor, he retired, he, he you know, or went back to retirement and we got a new pastor and, and I started growing my hair out. And, um, and here I was like, you know, long hair, long haired youth pastor. And you know, you can, you have your opinions about that or whatever. But, um, but for me, I was like, I, you know, I was living in that freedom. I, I, I felt free to have my hair long and uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it looked cool. I look back at pictures now. I'm not so sure that it looked cool, but, uh, but at, at some point I was, I was at church and, and uh, a woman came and she talked to me and she, she had a son who was in the youth group and his hair was kind of getting shaggy. It was getting long. And she had asked him to cut it cause she, you know, she wanted him to have shorter hair. And, uh, and at that point, like I could have easily argued with this woman, right? I could have easily been like, well, there's nothing wrong with long hair. There's whatever. Well, um, but for me, the primary issue was, you know, do, is this child going to honor his mother, right? Like she's asked him to cut his hair. It's not that big of an issue. He should cut his hair. But she said to me, she said, he told me he doesn't have to cut his hair because Pastor Bryce has long hair. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I, I went that night and I cut my hair. And why did I do that? Because for me, my freedom wasn't, it wasn't worth giving this kid an opportunity to dishonor his, his father and mother. They asked him to cut his hair and I, and I wasn't gonna let my freedom cause him to stumble. It wasn't that big of a deal. You know what, my hair grew back and eventually I had it even longer than it was then and, um, and I liked it, it was cool, it was awesome and that was the season and now it's gone and um, I've moved on. But I think that's the heart that all of us are called to when Paul says, don't tear apart what God is doing over food. Don't tear apart what God is doing over these disputable issues. Just like Rupertus said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. 
and in all things, charity. Love you, church. Bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.